Hello and welcome to Recyclist. It's January 19th, 2024. I'm your host, Eric Provost, and today we are being joined by a very special guest. Please help me welcome to Recyclist right now, the Chief Technology Officer of Sensit, Jason Gu. Thank you so much for joining me today, sir. Hey, Eric. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, great, great pleasure. Uh, we've had the pleasure of working with Sensit for, for quite some time now on some of your amazing devices. Uh, but, you know, there's still some things about the company that uh, that I'm really excited to learn. Like, uh, like what do you do, sir? What is your uh, experience and what is your uh, function within the company? Oh, God. You know, I think we all wear a lot of different hats here. But overall, I'm in charge of all the technology that goes into all of our products, right? So that um, encompasses looking for new sensors all the way down to how do we integrate those sensors into our handhelds or into our fixed point devices. And then evolving from there, how does that technology interact or how does those products interact with the the world at large? So ranging from, you know, how do you use them out in the field to, you know, how do you plug chug away at the data such that the data that we collect becomes actually information that's useful for whoever's out there. So just quite a wide range of things, but generally just the development of products um, and kind of where things are used. It sounds like a a job full of challenges, but also an incredibly interesting one that uh, probably doesn't leave a lot of room for boredom. No, it's actually, it's a incredibly rewarding experience, right? To see something you know, where it's just an idea in our heads and really kind of we're sitting around a meeting going, hey, what if we did this, right? And then to see that kind of evolve and grow uh, and to pare down, right? Some some ideas are bad and some ideas are good. And then eventually to see it kind of go out in the field and to start seeing people use it out in the wild is just a incredible experience, really. It's kind of a, you know, I mean, I don't think about it in terms of you can't call your baby ugly, but there's a little bit of that, right? Where there's a good <laughs> amount of pride. <laughs> I Yeah, I imagine there certainly would be. Um, I am also super interested to learn, you know, kind of how did Sense It wind up getting into this space? You know, gas analysis and emissions detection and, you know, fugitive emissions detection and, and stuff like that. What was it about this, you know, this industry in this area where Sense It really saw an opportunity? Oh God, you know, I think that's that's a very large question you just asked, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and and to be honest with you, I mean, since its involvement in this space, right? Fugitive emissions, leak detection kind of has evolved with the field, right? I think, you know, if you think back into the 90s and even 2000s, right? I mean, the idea of fugitive emissions and methane, you know, being something that could cause warming or could cause gl- climate change, really wasn't a thing, right? And so since it got into the field way back into the 80s when we first started, um, and in essence, it was a safety detector, right? It was a safety play where we were really more concerned about the safety of the individuals at the natural, at the natural gas companies going out um, to your homes and looking for leaks and pilot lights and um, you know piping and tubing within your house, right? Because since it really was started when, with NIPSCO, right? Because we're in Indiana, Northern Indiana. Mm -hmm. And so the father of our founder, John Kleppe, um, dealt with the gas utility in terms of he sold them piping and tubing. Uh, And NIPSCO built a gas detector called the gas track for use for their own employees. And because of the amazing relationship that he had with NIPSCO at the time, they're like, hey, we have a bunch of these extra ones. Do you want to sell these? You know, and I think that's actually how Sensit was first started. He had 500 spare gas detectors from NIPSCO. And he went around to different utilities wondering if these gas detectors would be useful for them. And time flies, you know, as you blink here, but then, you know, 20, 30 years later, we built, you know, tens of um, our own handhelds, right? We've evolved the technology from the kind of aspirated, you know, you have a s- sample that you're, you know, like a wand that you're waving around to open path laser systems, like the LZ30 that you've had experience with. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, and so, but from that side of it, it really started out as kind of a safety, making sure the gas worker was able to go home, right? Um, That he wasn't walking into a a, uh, combustible atmosphere. And then as kind of the safety world evolved, 
you know, making sure he wasn't going walking to a toxic atmosphere, right, with carbon monoxide yeah. and those types of things. And as really the collective consciousness of the world evolved from, you know, uh, methane leaks and CO leaks, right, and make sure people went home to, hey, we, you know, realizing that, you know, we need to minimize fugitive emissions in natural gas, but also in industrial settings, you know, since it kind of moved into this fixed point uh, and environmental space, right? And really, I joined Sensit through acquisition and um, the S pods, the ramps, you know, these types of products, which are VOC and environmental monitors, were part of my uh, company previously, right? And Sensit really saw an opportunity in terms of the evolution and realizing that just like us helping the industrial worker go home at the end of the day, you know, these products help the companies that we serve better comply, right? Basically get more bang for their buck in terms of yep. knowing when something's wrong, being able to locate what's wrong quicker. And then from there transitioning to a handheld instrument to be able to uh, locate the leak and then fix it ultimately. Yeah, and I can't wait to start talking about the RAM, start talking about the S-Pod. I am very interested in one specific aspect of you know going from a concept to a final product as the chief technology officer, do you often start with a technology or start with an application? Like, is it a chicken or an egg? Do you start with something and you think, well, we have this, how do we apply it to, you know, the industry? Or do you start with an application and kind of reverse engineer what you're going to possibly need to, to, uh, to deal with that application? I think at the end of the day, you need both chicken and eggs. And really what you find is that every one of these things kind of happen and they all kind of take on a life of its own, right? Sometimes we find a technology that we're like, this is so cool. Like actually the LZ30 was one of those things where we found this open path systems and we're like, this is awesome. Yeah, you know, LZ30 and, handheld methane detector. Yep. Yes, exactly. The, uh, the, handheld the, the, the handheld methane detector, that's an open path laser, right? And so you see it and you're like, this is awesome. And you, it, seeing that technology kind of drives this, thought process in your head of, man, what can I use it for? You know, and so you see that happening. But on the other end too, there are tons of cases where, for example, the S-Pod, right? You know, we saw, oh man, we really need this and we need this to trigger canisters and these types of things. And so you're like, okay, well, I need to go find something to be able to do this. So we've, we've seen it start both ways. And as I said, these opportunities kind of take on a life of their own and how they start really is a little bit unique. And I know the, the S-Pod specifically that you were just talking about is something that you guys have been excited about for, for some time. And for those out there who might not be familiar with the product, what is kind of your pitch to people? How do you explain the S-Pod to, uh, to people within the industry? So the S-Pod monitors uh, volatile organic compounds. So anything that smells kind of bad, right? And the real kind of claimed for the s pod is the fact that it's semi portable right so it's something that um you can just put on a tripod put it outside near a site and the s pod itself will send data via cellular communications to a server and it allows you to view the data remotely right so in essence um it's a handheld that can be used when you're not there and so people now can, if they have something that happens, uh, you know, they have a leak that pops up or, you know, they're starting with a new wellhead, those types of things, um, they can go deploy three or four of these out there for a few months and then they can take them back down and they can move it somewhere else, right? So it's kind of one of those things where the benefit really is the fact that, you know, it's a fixed point monitor that you that can be easily moved and doesn't require you to drag power out there doesn't require you to drag communication lines out there and then it still gives you access to the data and what are you guys seeing from field applications in terms of people finding other uses for it yeah and actually so people have used them in really kind of unique and clever ways you know yeah um there's lots of places where the s-pod is being used to um comply with environmental regulations for example colorado right you have reg 7 in colorado which requires VOC monitoring um, before uh, you start drilling in a well pad. And then it requires monitoring of these VOCs 60 days after the last well pad is finished on your site. So, and don't quote me on the, num on the exact numbers, of course, but in essence, as these sites are coming into production, right, people are placing 
VOC monitors at these sites two or three at a time, um, doing all the pre-measurements. And then these devices get deployed through the finishing of the pad, through the initial production until you no longer need to be to have them there. And then they pick them back up and they move them to another pad, right? And so there's this constant stream of, um, of S-pods moving from site to site to site, which is fascinating. The other really cool applications that we're hearing about, you know, are things like they're taking the S-pods and their people are putting them on vehicles so that they can drive these S-pods around. And then they're sending all this data out via remote telemetry, right? Which then, you know, you're able to see uh, from a geospatial perspective, you know, whether you have VOCs drifting across a road, right? And then a lot of times people don't even know that these S-pods are on the vehicle in the sense that plants are just putting them on normal plant vehicles. And these plant, these vehicles drive around the plant all the time. And so it's almost passively sampling, right? Your entire plant over, you know, periods of weeks and months without you really knowing that, without you actually actively trying to sample. And that I think is a really unique and kind of innovative way of using these devices. The other kind of main application really is to connect a, a canister trigger, right? With these S-pods. So what happens there is, you know, a lot of plants are required to, to take canister samples, right? However, normally you just take canister samples every, every night at, you know, 1 AM or some regular interval, but yeah. what guarantee do you have that the sample that you're, you're collecting is useful? Is the wind even blowing the right way to be capturing the stuff that's going on in your plant versus your neighbor's plant? Right. And so people put these S pods out there, they're measuring wind speed, wind direction. And then they're using the S pod, which can, you know, we have a, a canister trigger system. They're using the S pod to connect to our canister trigger system, which then triggers a canister when the wind is blowing in the right direction. And when, you know, you're seeing high VOCs from the S pod, right? So then from there, they can take the canister, send it to a lab and do the analysis on what specific species of VOCs are present. But in essence, it's saving people, you know, um, you don't have to send as many canisters to the lab. It's saving people money, but then also the canisters you do send, you know, those samples were collected in high VOC events, yeah. which is awesome. Right. I honestly, you know, we've had quite a bit of uh, firsthand experience with the S pod, uh, at our offices, but, you know, putting them on the backs of trucks and doing some of the things that people <laughs> out in the field have already started. It was is, it kind of blew my mind when I started hearing about that. I was like, that is so cool. Yeah. yeah. And actually like, I mean, we have some projects going on now where like, you know, people are literally like it's it's just passive sampling, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you have to drive a route every single day anyway, you might as well collect some data, right? By and and the S pod, as you know, and I'm sure you guys have pictures of the of the device, but it's it's a box about, you know, one foot by one foot. It's not it's not very invasive or kind of protruding out anywhere. So you can find a clever way to mount it and then you're basically collecting data doing something that you normally do, which is awesome. It's just yeah. free. Yeah. yeah, we uh, we actually know somebody who has their own like little personal chicken farm and like their own little personal uh, uh, operation going on, and they actually have an S pod set up on on their back uh, porch. Oh, that's awesome! I didn't, I hadn't heard about that. So yeah, that's that, that's another really cool application that uh, that we've been testing in the S pod out, and uh, I just thought that was really cool too. Yeah, we'll yeah. have to to get you some pictures of that. <laughs> no, that we would we would love it. The the other application that I think we're, we're just starting to get into with the S-Pod is that we recently got our hazardous location certification for the S-Pod, yeah. right? So like it's a class one div two. So, you know, traditionally, and I know you guys have a lot of experience deploying S-Pods onto like non-hazardous locations, right? But mm -hmm. if you think refinery or you think plants, like traditionally the S-Pods can't go into the plant, right? Because it's a hazardous location and you don't want the um, S pod to cause any uh, dangerous situations, right? But with our recent kind of class one div two certification, the S pod can now go beyond the fence line, right? So, so you don't have to put it outside the fence line. You can now go into the fence line and put it into, you know, various um, process units. And you and from there, the S pod can then kind of detect leaks closer to where the leak is, which gives you a much better chance of localizing exactly where that leak's coming from. 
yeah, a lot of lot of really cool applications to to use the S Pod with. I assume we're probably going to be seeing those all over the place in the coming years. You guys uh, also have a, a really interesting uh, system, this ramp system. Uh, I'm sure people would like to hear about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and so like, if you think of the S Pod as something that's really specialized, right? So like, you know, it's it's a single VOC monitor, and typically, like when someone comes uh, to us and they're like, "Hey, we want VOCs," we're like, "S Pod is the way to go." The mm-hmm. ramp is like the other side of the spectrum, right? The ramp is kind of like if someone comes to us and they're like, "Hey, we're we know there's something. People smell bad things or whatever, right? People things smell bad, but we're not sure exactly what it is." we tell people to go to the ramp, right? The ramp instead of the, um, is a box that has cellular telemetry. So it can access the cellular networks. It can have a anemometer attached to it. And then it has basically slots for five to six sensors. So those five to six sensors within some reason, right? You can pick what they are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, we commonly have requests where they're, they'll kind of be like, Hey, we want to know VOCs, but we also want to know like H2S. Right. Or we also want to know, you know, um, uh, SO2 or, or some other, you know, air pollutant. And so we'll be like, well, we can kind of customize the S pod and do things, but it's not exactly what you want. Whereas the ramp, although you might only have two sensors in the three, in the five sensor slots, but it gives you kind of this much broader look on the, on the species that's being characterized. And so primarily the ramp is you has been used for air quality monitoring right? Just because of how general it can be. Mm-hmm. And so people have used it for community monitoring. You know, we have ramps out in a, in a few different communities where people are just looking at the data and, you know, it's educating them on what's going on at like a school, right? For example, um, to try to keep air clean for that school. But on the other side of it, industrial folks use it too, where, you know, there was where, oh man, there's been a lot of odor complaints around yeah. this one facility of ours. Yeah. And you can put one we VOC see that a monitor. Lot. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And then, and like you can put one VOC monitor there, or you can put VOC plus H2S plus ammonia, you know, and you can kind of couple the system that you want for it. Especially with the, the, the odor complaints, that's something we hear from people we work with fairly often, especially, you know, at landfills that are yep. uh, even remotely close to, to residential areas, obviously. Right. And actually, like, I mean, there's uh, there's new proposed legislation in California, right, for um, oil and gas installations within 3,200 feet of a residential area, exactly mm-hmm. as you're talking about, you know, them requiring a leak detection system for methane and H2S. Yeah. And between the spot and the ramp, we we also really, really enjoy the, the LZ30, the ease of use. It just it fits right in your hand, gives you incredibly accurate readings. Like you said, the, the laser. Uh, how much excitement are you guys seeing from that? Yeah. And so like, we see quite a bit of excitement actually. And, you know, it's um, like the, the utilities use it in such an interesting way, right. Where, you know, if your neighbor smells kind of gas and he thinks it's coming from your house and you're not home instead of, you know, opening the door or, you know, trying to get into your house, they can shoot the LZ 30 through like windows and those types of things. Mm -hmm. Um, However, like from an industrial setting, Right. We see the LZ30, especially for methane, being so useful in the sense that like we have these fixed point detectors, right, that can kind of give you, hey, the leaks coming from this like couple hundred feet area. Right. But in that couple hundred feet area, you know, you can have a thousand joints. Yeah. Right. And if you take one of those kind of like, you know, like kind of like our G3 instrument, which is like, you know, it's a wand with a pump inside, it could take you so long to go through those thousand joints, right? Just looking at every one. And then the other side of it, if you get like an OGI camera, that thing could be in the, you know, hundred thousand dollars, right? And getting a crew out there and those types of things. And so that's where we really see the LZ30 getting a lot of traction is the fact that, hey, this is a, you know, relatively inexpensive um, instrument, right? It's, you know, significantly less than the OGI camera, but then you can kind of walk through your site and go, hey, where is it? And within 10 seconds, right? Or within a few minutes of walking your site, you should be able to find where the leak is. Um, yeah, you just, you, you take it out of the case, you turn it on, you point, and you're like, oh, there it is. Exactly. And actually the the picture that we always show internally is there was a um, condo complex in Philadelphia, right? And mm-hmm. there was people walking by and they were smelling gas. 
Uh, but, and like, if you know, these condos and these high rise condos, you have like 200 meters on the side of that thing, right? Cause exactly, each one is, yeah. you know, and so the guy was walking around with, with, with one of our other instruments, like a G2 and he's like, oh man, this is going to take all day. And I think their supervisor drove by and had an LZ30 in his van and they found the leak within, you know, five minutes of the guy getting there. Right. And I think that's the real value of these things. And you can imagine the same thing in an industrial setting where, all right, it's within this, you know, hundred feet square foot by hundred, you know, hundred feet by hundred feet is square. This is gonna take us forever. You take this LZ30 out, you find it within a few minutes. Yeah, especially when you're talking about a ton of pipes and nuts and bolts and potential, you know, leak areas. Exactly. Exactly. I know you guys, I know you were talking a little bit about you guys have some stuff coming down, you know, pun intended, I guess, but coming down the pipeline uh, <laughs> uh, over at Sensor, where you got some new stuff that you're excited about. Yeah, absolutely, actually. So we, we've been working on, uh, over the actually over the past, oh God, three or four years, we've been working on um, a closed path laser technology, right? So the difference between open path and closed path is the fact that open path, you're kind of just shooting the laser out into the air, right? And then whatever it bounces off of, it comes back. And then we analyze the characteristics of what of the laser going out and the laser coming back, and we can figure out what the methane concentration is. The, the benefit of that is that it's very easy to walk around and kind of point to things, right? The downside though, is that you have to contend with like, I mean, really everything that goes out, you know, goes on in the real world, right? It, the surface changes from metal to wood. So you're kind of fighting all these things. And what that ends up being is that it becomes less accurate and less sensitive than what it can be. And so with a closed path system, what's going on is essentially we have these two mirrors and we're bouncing this laser back and forth between these two mirrors, right? To get, you know, five meters of path length within 10 inches. And what we're doing is we're sucking gas through this chamber with these two mirrors in it. And so as you're sucking gas in, this laser is detecting because it's got the path things is so long. It's detecting with very high accuracy what the methane concentration is in the sample that you're sucking in. Mm. Um, yeah, like I mean, we've been you know like our tests are showing it going down to 100, 150 parts per billion of of methane, right? And it's oh, methane wow. only. Yeah, it's very very sensitive. And then we did testing last year at Metech, which is kind of this fake oil and gas facility where they can release methane at you know a number five or six different installations of essentially fake oil and gas assets right so wellheads and those types of things yeah. and we, de we we deployed a system of six of these of, of of six of these lasers and we were able to locate a good amount of leaks and we were able to tell basically uh whenever metech was leaking something into the 80 90 percent accuracy range so it was it was really exciting this laser cell that we had that can go down to 100 you know 100 150 parts per billion we have taken this core technology right? we're talking about before with technology you know what technology we find and we put it into a handheld unit which is our pmd2 which i know you you probably have heard of and then we put it into a fixed point unit which is our fmd right so the pmd2 aligns kind of with our traditional natural gas products where you have it around your you know you have a strap and it just sits uh on the side of your hip and you have a probe and you're kind of waving the probe around and is able to detect really low concentrations of methane. Whereas the fixed point, the FMD is more like the S pod, right? We basically have a small pump and this laser cell in a box uh, connected to cellular telemetry that then basically collects the data from the FMD and then dump, you know, from the laser cell and then dumps it out to a server. So it's kind of two different flavors of this technology. Um, so it's really exciting. It's something that we're, we're really excited about and I think it's really helping us understand um, at least the sites that we're at, like understand exactly what the what the emissions from those sites, at least in terms of methane, really is. And is this closed point system? Do you think that's potentially a 2024 rollout? So actually, we started testing it um, in uh, you know at Metech at the beginning of 2023, right? So we were part of their um, ADED. Oh, and I don't remember the acronym, but they have essentially uh, a blind study. Right, where they don't tell us when the leaks are and we have to tell them when we think it's leaking and mm -hmm. that was the study that i was talking about yep um and actually we've been deploying these over the past six months already so it's it's been really exciting for us to kind of see the thing get in the field and as with everything right when the first time we deployed you know we learned a whole lot yeah right and we're like oh man these these things are important 
And then as we're deploying them, we're kind of figuring out what are the important things and even what do you do with the data? You know, so, oh, great. You now have methane and this is how much methane there is at this point on the fence line, right? Then realizing, okay, you need how many of them around a site to correctly calibrate, you know, or, or to correctly understand, you know, what the emissions are. And then we've been working a lot with the US EPA on some of the methods or some of the, the, the thought processes around how do you take these you know, half a ppm of methane at this corner and, and the wind is blowing this way, how much methane is actually leaking from your site, right? Or, you know, how large is the leak in kilograms per hour? We've been working with them on some ways to calculate that. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you've certainly got enough on your plate right now. It's been busy, and but I mean, in all fairness, right? It's been really fun. I mean, it's just kind of a point of personal passion to see kind of these products and really for us to be helpful, right? Um, in terms of protecting the environment, protecting people, right? And protecting industry. It's, I think everybody in the building here is extremely passionate about that. Yeah, that's something that we always got when we uh, ever interacting with, with Scented is it was very clear you guys were, were very passionate about, you know, these devices, this technology and, you know, the benefits that they could provide to, you know, a number of different industries, not just landfills, but, you know, so like drilling, like you were talking about fence lines and, and so many other different applications and industries that some people out there might not even consider, you know, on the offset. No, absolutely. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, for us, it's about um, providing value to our customers. Mm -hmm. Right. And I hope it's something that you've all that, that, you know, you guys have always felt whenever you deal with us, right. Is that we try our best to be helpful you know, um, and it's not just purely a, Hey, buy more stuff. It's a, okay. How, what happened? How, how can we better deploy or how can we change our stuff even to kind of meet the needs of our customers? And I think from the environmental side, we, we really have a very wide range of different customers, right? From oil and gas companies, you know, to, uh, regulators, right. Um, you know, EPA, right. Uh, to environmental consultants, um, all sorts of things. So it's this big wide range of customers. And I think it's really cool to see the industry move forward and everybody kind of come to some level of consensus of, oh man, this is what we have to do to operate responsibly. Yeah. And since you since you gave me the perfect segue, I'll go ahead and mention right now that if you'd like more information about the S-Pod, the Rant, the LZ30, about anything that Sensit provides, uh, you can reach out to Diamond Scientific. Uh, you can call them at 321-223-7500. Or you can reach them online at Diamond SI. That's DiamondSCI.com. Again, if you're looking for more information or even a quote for, uh, again, the LZ30, the, the S Pod, the Ramp, you know, all of these really awesome Sensei products that are uh, they're out there making uh, so many people's lives easier at this point. And Jason, I want to thank you so much again for coming on Recyclus today, joining us and, and talking about this super interesting science, this super interesting technology that you guys are rolling out over there at Sensit Technologies. Perfect. Thank you so much, Eric. And uh, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure for us. And uh, sir, I hope we get to talk again soon. But uh, once again, everybody, thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Recyclist, and we will see you next time. Thank you.